Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome back again. This is the fourth uh, Saturday with Stephen show <clears throat> and um, glad to see that, you know, numbers are creeping up and people are seem to be interested. So no pressure, Stephen. And um, I know we just had a little blip there, so I know you're focused. So welcome again. Looking forward to, uh, looking forward uh, to another show. Uh, I'd blame the technology, but, um, but uh, that wouldn't be the case. It's the user. It's always the user. Well, yeah. good morning, Chris. Good to be here again. Right, great. So just a quick recap, Steve. Um, basically, now it's just about, um, you know, where we are in the week and a week from within a crisis. And I think positive changes are coming, which is good. Had some very good sessions earlier on the week with Salem and some of the guests. And that was with Tiaka, Fadaxa, Ayata and ACI. And it's great to see that they're working together, collaboration, etc., and that they're actually supporting the three C's uh, message that came out from WHO, which is communication, cooperation, and collaboration. Now, we touched on that last week, and um, I know that you're very, very positive about how we can do things and, and how simple we need to keep them. But have you got any extended comments now on, on the communication, cooperation, collaboration wordings? Um, <clears throat> I guess, you know, in, you know, my view is that um, the, you know, getting, getting some consistency in the messaging is, is helpful. Um, and, you know, it's, it's kind of pleasing to see that so the industry bodies have now formed and agreed on some of that, some of that messaging. Um, at least some of the policies that, are, that we've seen come out this week from, from the likes of IASA and IATA are aligned and that's a good start and that's consistent. Um, yeah, so having consistency in there is helpful. But I think on the communication piece, the one the one thing that we touched on last week was you know the effort that airlines are going to, particularly <clears throat> in the social media space. And uh, you know, I've seen a pretty you know a, a good few examples um, of what carriers are doing that they're using on social media to communicate to their customers. I guess really in order to re help rebuild confidence and restore confidence in, in the in the in the consumer space, and I think that that's that's as important. So there's there's a fourth C for you. I think confidence is is is, is probably another one we can add on tag onto the list. It's coming, um, my friend. I've got plenty of them. They're coming. Look, I'm sure you do, Chris. A man a man with a, a man with an acronym, but um, never 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 short of an acronym. <clears throat> but you know, confidence is 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 important. I think you know some examples, standard examples for me are. You know, the work that Wizz Air have done, particularly around social media, they were one of the first to restart in Europe. Uh, they've been very active, um, you know, both both corporately from from Joseph and the and 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 the team, but also also in the consumer space. And I think a lot of that messaging that they've done has been really really very good. It's all it's all about restoring confidence at this stage as we try to restore, you know, restore a return to 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 normality. Yeah, no, it's brilliant, and I, I've got to add at this point. Uh, last week we mentioned Wizz Air, <laughs> and now we've mentioned Wizz Air. We're, we're not sponsored by Wizz Air. <laughs> but I have to also say, I did see that video, and uh, and you're 100 percent right. It's it's just showing all the things that they're doing behind the scene, yeah. and for people, people themselves, they they're, they're going to start here. You've got fear over here. You've got confidence over here. Everybody as an individual has got to do their own risk assessment to see at what point they're going to do certain things based on their own based on their own evaluation. Exactly. Yeah. And anybody who can influence them and show them that they're erring on the side of you know, caution, you know, uh, mitigation, et cetera, they're going to win people over rather than those who are doing nothing or not seen to be doing anything. <coughs> so that's great. Now, okay, brilliant. Now, taking things a little bit further, so what we want to do today, another set of three Cs, which helps with that consumer confidence, um, which is clarification, coordination, and control. And during the last week, we were also talking quite a lot about ICAO state letters and how fast ICAO are, you know, pumping out guidelines and, and um, best practices, etc. So everybody in the industry seems to be coming together now a lot more quicker than they ever did before. So there seems to be a lot more emphasis on being an enabler rather than a blocker or, a, or, or somebody who's just, you know, not quite sure what to do, which is great. So it's this clarification for people that's so important. Well, I think as we've touched on before, um, you know, part of the challenge was the the first movers, um, you know, that, that are trying to restore confidence in the market and that are sort of out there doing their own doing their own thing. Um, I guess you know the likes of of Wizz Air is one, Qatar Airways maybe another. They didn't seem to have stopped much. They seem to have sort of you know continued them um, plodding along without um, without much um, um, concern. 
Um, I don't mean that in a negative sense. I mean that, 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 that they had the confidence to, to, to continue operations. And maybe that was right, maybe that was wrong. There'd be different views on that. But what was important is that I guess that, that you know, whilst there, whilst there are those carriers that are pushing the boundaries and moving forward and trying to do their own thing, the challenge they've got, of course, is that they're always, they're always usurped at the other end of, of the route or down line. Yeah. Because because you know they they, they might they might get some common standards or application of of decent decent outcomes in their hub or their home base, Doha, London, Gatwick, whatever whatever it might well be. Um, the problem they've then got is consistency on application and the other the other end of the of the of of, of the route. So, <clears throat> I think it's very pleasing now to see that not only EASA have 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 um, come out and you know provided much more detailed guidance and policy. Uh, um, you know, and comms around this, but also, <clears throat> you know, the main trade body IATA have done the same with their for their member airlines, um, and they've also reassuringly. I mean, I always I always challenge IATA about you know what what how much how much teeth they've got you know um, because um, a toothless tiger is a pretty is a pretty ineffectual um, uh, predator, um, and therefore. Um, it's nice to see that they've exposed their teeth this week by the by the industry adopting the common sense approach, which is social distancing on aircraft will not work. However, all of the other control measures that we've prescribed and described and put in place are are have to be universal and have to be have to be adopted um, across the board. I think that was very reassuring and pleasing for me to see because IATA has historically um, you know tried to represent its members' interests. And in this case, they have they they are well, they're still doing so, but actually they're representing a much broader uh, and, and sort of more macro, wider, wider, um, wider, wider PCO. So I think that was that was probably my um, uh, news of the week, if you like, in terms of 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 seeing that common sense approach. There's not a lot of common sense. A lot of people expect you know, the public to have more common sense than probably they do. Um, uh, but common sense, of course, is relative and not universal. Um, uh, so we need policy and we need rules and we need regulations. And if we do that, then we're probably in a much better place than we are expecting people to do their own thing. Yeah, no, I agree with you. That was good. And it, and it was very clear of what the impact would be um, on everybody, including the consumer, if, if people did expect social distancing on aircraft. And the same thing from airports. Yeah. ACI were also saying that, you know, if they had to, if they had to do it as per people's general understanding <clears throat> you only be able to operate the airport um, you don't you'd only be able to operate the airport at about a 30 to 40 percent capacity which which again doesn't make sense well, nonsense nonsense um, but what everybody did agree is you know there is going to be a slower uptake so it's not going to be a v curve or maybe it's going to be a little wider u curve but you know people are going to have to experience and, and, and expect that that's not going to be the way it was before now controls Stephen mm -hmm. okay so at the end of the day there does or there will have to be certain controls in place and for controls people need clear lists they need they need specifics that's how people feel comfortable so what are your thoughts about the types of controls that should be put into place well I think <clears throat> the, the problem the problem I guess that we've got in terms of managing the restart is 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 we have to test the effectiveness of each of the control measures and so, um, you know, some questions still about, you know, whether whether there have been uh, or there has been transmission on a case to case or case by case basis on aircraft um, of uh, of COVID nineteen. That that remains, a, 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 I guess, a debatable point and a challenging point. The problem, therefore, I guess we've got is that um, is that uh, you know, with the various control measures that that are that are being you know, prescribed so you know masks and cleanliness and um, you know no standing in aisles or galleys and, and no queuing for toilets and toilet um, uh, uh, you know uh, disinfectation and cleaning standards on the ground are going to change. You know, all of those are, I guess, you know, um, uh, control measures that we're asking industry to adopt. Um, as we said last week, you know, the, the, the biggest control measure is not to fly. Now we've been doing that for a few months. That's been that's been that's been, I guess, you know, helpful and 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 and, and partly. Partly contributed to the to the demise of of the um, of the spread and transmission rates of of, of COVID, but I think Chris, it, it, it look, I mean, it's a bit of a moving feast. Uh, you know, it's a it's it's a difficult one to judge because I think I think how does one test the effectiveness of those control measures, and uh, you know who is who is there to sample and who is there to to measure, and quality assess the outcomes of those of those measures. That's that's actually a pretty tough thing I think to 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 do. So. 
I think if industry, if industry does what it says, like, you know, a bit of, um, uh, um, uh, you know, does what it says on the tin. Um, and Ron Seal, that's the one. Ron Seal, thanks, Chris. Yes, Ron Seal. Um, uh, does what it says, you know, if, if, if we follow those measures and adopt those measures as, as far as practically possible, and you have the odd outliers, you know, the sort of spikes or you, 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 you know, I think it, it's, a, it's probably, a, probably a case of delegating some of that responsibility to the aviation authorities in states or, or you know, uh, an approved audit group or a group of carriers or, you know, maybe, maybe a bit like sort of the, um, uh, sort of, I don't want to sort of use this as the best example, but the, you know, a- airlines within the IOSA sort of pool, you know, they are, they are you know, quality assuring and, and auditing one another. You know, there has to be some level of, of, of you know, checks and balances that, that will become part and parcel of the normal way that we now do things going forward. Um, yeah. You know, so as much as it, you get a station audit or a turnaround audit, an aircraft audit, or a security audit, whatever, you will, you will get a, a, um, you know, an audit on your, on your control hygiene. measures for hygiene. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, which high, yeah, hygiene and health is going to be prominent now in the, in the new normal. <clears throat> the reason I asked the question is, during the week... Um, one of the guys who I know quite well, he was talking to me and he said to me, he said, he said, uh, all these aircraft still flying overhead. I said, yeah, I said, you know, a lot of them will be freighters and, and there'll be passenger aircraft with freight on board. And we just started talking and he said to me about, he heard the news about Spain, you know, if you go to Spain, you've got to go in a two week lockdown. And then he said to me, he said, so every pilot that goes over there, he said, they've got to stay for two weeks before they can come back. <laughs> and it's, but yeah, you're laughing, but it's that sort of it's that sort of rule or that sort of control that that the public think then somebody is breaking a rule or breaking a control, and that's why I was so pleased. Like last week, you know, talking with Glenn Shires um, from Fedaxa and Vladimir Zubkov from Tiarka, and then obviously this week we had Glenn Hughes from Ayata and Michael Russell from ACI. They were very, very aware of the fact that now the communication needs to be broader and needs to be more transparent to let people know that, well, if you want medical supplies and if you want PPE and if you want all of these things to keep everything going, there has to be certain exceptions or certain mitigated exceptions that would allow that to operate normal. So it's almost like there's, there's a I, I like set that. of rules. That's no different, Chris, to the way that we operate today. I mean, there are, there, 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 there are, there are exceptions to policy um, and, and prescribed exceptions. The problem we've got is, is discretion is not exception. Yes. Um, and, and that's where you've got the problem. So my level of discretion, um, you know, on, on my um, measure of, of gin um, might be very different to the, to the guy in the bar who's pouring the gin. His discretion might be, might be pretty, um, pretty non-existent. And that's the problem that, that that is that is and that is not therefore prescribed. Whereas if exceptions are prescribed and they're risk assessed and they're controlled and they're as universal as practically possible, there'll be different different measures by states, different exceptions by states yeah, or yeah. countries or groups of countries or the bubbles or whatever. That that's all fine. But um, but one can't um, you know uh, sort of uh, expect that this is any different to normal business you know business as usual, which has all of these exceptions in in in, in place. It's the same thing on. You know, visa requirements, air crew visa requirements. You know, some countries require air crew to have visa, but most majority, majority, um, majority don't for short transit trips, etc. But they require you or I entering to enter on a visa. So you know, the, 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 exactly. The, the, but th- this is this is the point. I think it's good that people are now realising that they need to give a little bit more transparency to get greater acceptance and understanding and appreciation. Mm-hmm. Because even if you look at, you know, some of the politicians are saying something and then suddenly the public go mad. Ah, oh, that's not right. This isn't right, etc. Because they're, they're just not used to that, that level of thinking. And I think it's good now that things have been a lot more transparent. Indeed. And yep. from what, what the guys were saying with ICAO and the state letters and, and even some states, you know, they weren't taking an understanding of how long you can keep an aircraft on the ground and flying hours, etc., so as a result of that, it puts more pressure on the GHA to load the aircraft quicker in unusual circumstances with a lot higher um, number of employees required to load the normal. So again, it's putting more pressure on the GHA. So I'm, I'm on a sort of a, uh, what would I say? I'm on a little bit of a, a little bit of a stampede, you know, to make the GHAs um, be, be better thought of and more appreciated. And, and, you know, thinking about it, you've got 30, 40 guys plus maybe involved in loading an aircraft, a passenger aircraft, 
um, inside the cabin, which is, you know, it's never been done before. And, and all of a sudden now, you know, you've got all this extra cost, extra time pressures. And um, again, I just think they, they really do need a, a lot well, more. This, 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 is, this, this is also where, you know, behavioural behavioral change or, you know, uh, um, you know customers adopting, adopting um, you know, uh, you know uh, take an example on cabin baggage, for example. So I've seen some airlines are restricting cabin baggage to one piece per customer. Um, um, uh, you know, to maintain space and social distancing in cabin and baggage and so on. Um, you know, others are, are, are having to apply those social distancing standards on the ramp, for example, in the loading space or so in the cargo terminal or the build-up area or, or whatever, whatever. Um, but remember when, you know, when, when, um, when a, 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 a mate of mine, a good mate of mine, a guy called um, John Thomas, he's, he's formerly known as the bag man. Are you uh, sure? Is that his real name? His name is John Thomas. Yes, Chris. Yeah. yeah that's always good. Um, a set of parents with a sense of humour. <laughs> um, anyway, John was known as the bag man. He introduced bag fees in, uh, uh, in the US. Um, uh, he was sort of, you know, drove that, that evolution. If you look at what that did to market, that changed consumer behaviours. That meant that people then started to think more carefully about how they travelled, what they travelled with, um, you know, and they, and they changed their behaviour accordingly. That meant less, less, less bags in hold and, and, and you know, more bags in cabin. I think you know some of these these hygiene or new health standards will do the same, and customers will adopt a new approach. And therefore, I don't think, and I disagree with you about you know the you know um, you know shortening turn times um, or or so the impact of social distancing on turn times means extra labour. Actually, I look at it the opposite way. I think actually labour has to be right sized based on 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 task and function, not on not on not on time. Um, so people do time and motion studies and spend all sorts of hours and very, very, you know, um, uh, scientific surveys on, on time and motion studies on, on turnaround times, which lots of people have done. It's a great, great thing for a lot of the university grads doing all these, this exciting stuff. However, it's really very simple. The more people you put on the turnaround, the more people you engage on the turn, the, the higher your engagement standards of resources, the more people there are to trip over themselves, therefore the less, the less space there is in, you know, people to work in, in a, in a, in a given area. So actually, it's not about necessarily trying to trying to you know squeeze the same out of what we've got today. It's actually about taking a step back and saying, how do we change consumer behaviour sufficiently to ensure that we can still deliver a viable proposition, a quick turnaround, a short turnaround, a viable product, and minimise our our cost exposures to ensure that we've got a viable business going forward. Because if industry doesn't do that and they start having to extend turn times or you know, lengthen, lengthen the, um, the, the turnaround time to adopt, you know, a, a, you know, an increased labor on the turn, that will, that will actually kill, kill our, um, kill our, uh, our game. Beautifully put, beautifully put. But where I was coming from was Praters. So where ground crews are having to load passenger belly space, uh, sorry, passenger cabin space, and they're having to have 30, they're actually doing like a man link chain. So I'm only talking about the sudden, the, 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 the pressures at the moment, not, not the general turnaround time. So what I was talking about was <clears throat> the DHAs at the moment. So you see the videos from, from Emirates or Cathay Pacific where they've got all the guys, you know, and they're, they're, they're passing it link chain across and then they're in the cabin, passing it all the way down the cabin and putting it in the seats, netting and everything else. This is just at this particular moment. In I, was, time. I, was, I, was, I was a step ahead of you there. Chris. Yeah, and as, you always are, as you always are, as you always are. But um, 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 look, I guess you know there may be a bit of um, there may be a bit of um, you know um, you know, sort of self self publication and a lot of that stuff as well. I guess that some of the carriers have been doing the a little bit of pat on the back, um, which is always good and always helpful. And motivation is is good for for people. But I guess a lot of that has been um, you know driven driven by necessity also to to ensure that the assets, the aircraft. Um, and the people are being used during this during this time and for for a purpose that they can they can make some you know take some income from rather than sitting sitting on the deck. But um, I do think that we've seen a lot of these videos that have that have been um, you know uh, self promoting I guess and how how industry has has done some wonderful stuff. I agree and that that's great and we're right to publicise that stuff. But um, but it's becoming it's becoming you know it's becoming very very uh, sort of prevalent now I guess and and and. Um, I hope for the right reasons, but 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 sometimes sometimes question some of the some of the value in that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I agree. Anyhow, we've cleared that one up, so that's nice. Well done. Now, um, taking on another set of three C's: consistency, contingency, and continuity. 
Now, I was talking to the guys last week and I was saying how many companies now, you know, they, they probably didn't realize that they should be taking a lot more focus and attention on business continuity. And if you look at the way the businesses have gone, and now in a relatively short time, being out of operation, so many businesses can't survive. Now, that's obviously a, a, a cost issue, it's a margin issue, and it's a strategy issue, and it's chasing, chasing the buck, and, and there's been so much competition, and obviously we're not going to be going into pricing or anything like that on this particular show. But the point of organizations now and shareholders focusing on what type of a company has got the continuity capability to see through any further issues that may come as a result of this particular crisis or any similar crisis. And I was talking to a couple of young lads this morning and um, we, had, we had a show during the week about careers and what you should do, et cetera. And what they were saying is now that before they do anything, they're going to be looking at what types of businesses are crisis proof. And, and that's where they want to be. So they don't want to. So one of them was thinking of going into marketing. So he said, as soon as something goes wrong, first things companies do is they cut their marketing budget, no advertising, no this, no that. So they were actually, you know, they were talking about which industry is crisis proof. So I think there's going to be a different outlook because there definitely is going to be a new normal. Things have changed and they're going to change more and things are going to be different moving forward. What do you think well, about? Well, I think, think about you know, being, being responsible now and looking at what type of continuity or sustainability elements are part of your business tactics and strategy. Well, Chris, look, um, crisis proof. I mean, you and I wouldn't be working in aviation if we wanted a crisis free industry, that's for sure, or a crisis free career, because this industry has had more crises thrown at it than I suspect any other. Um, uh, I, guess, I guess the thing that springs to mind for me is resilience. You know, this, this is a very resilient industry. And it has demonstrated that time and time again, um, whether it be through you know uh, you know global financial crisis or or uh, you know economic crises or natural disasters, etc. And I guess um, a lot of learnings that come from those the responses to those. Um, I guess it's worth considering how one aggregates or or consolidates some of the some of the um, you know the learnings from those previous crises, yeah. and then taps into them. To develop their future crisis or, or contingency planning um, uh, uh, response, um, and I suspect, I mean, you know, nobody could have predicted an event of, of this nature would have such damaging and long-lasting and ever everlasting, you know, consequences for our industry and, and and the globe as a whole. But I think it's really important that we sort of, you know, now is the time when people have got a bit of time to take stock to actually sort of, you know, sort of think through some of the learnings and, and start to build build a better a better profile across their businesses and across the across their sphere of operations um you know and lock that into their into their business continuity plan and go forward yeah no i agree and and, and i and generally i think once once mr hindsight 2020 knocks on a lot of doors you know people are going to start to think a lot differently and i think there'll be a little bit of a concession in in bottom line um towards you know spending a bit more time on that sort of yeah. focus I think you know we we spoke about it, I think the last couple of shows is 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 you know the big you, know, you spoke about sort of you know profitability and and and, and squeeze on 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 pricing and so on but I guess for me the, the the old adage you know some some may say controversially but the, you know cash is king this yep. this is a game of liquidity and so you know actually when looking at your contingency planning or your business continuity actually is you know how many months cash do I need in the bank to be able to survive this whether you're a service provider or an airline or whatever I guess those those are the airlines now that we're seeing. They yep. are they are able to respond. They're able to to maintain the you know keep their head above the water, um, and um, you know a lot of a lot of a lot of um, businesses will will disappear after this, and that's very sad. And and brands that are very well known to people, but yeah, but yep. actually there should maybe be much more focus on cash generation and cash cash um, cash on hand, cash in back in, in liquidity terms that, that that will be able to see people through this. So I think that that probably also has to. Has to, will, will play a big part in, in contingency planning or continuity, um, business continuity planning going forward. Yeah, yeah, and it's and I think it's long overdue. Now, Steve, questions. We've had some more questions during the week, so it's great. So, got a, a combination set of questions from uh, Craig Ellis, who's currently furloughed and working for EasyJet. Um, so, what he said, just mixing the mixing the content up a little bit, is how as an industry 
will we recover from such a skills gap and shortage when we commence the recovery stage? And he's, he's referring to the fact that, uh, you know, within the industry, we're seeing a lot of experienced staff members now either leaving or finding alternative work or taking early retirement. And, and unfortunately, as we've seen in most of the press, there's going to be a lot of redundancy as well. So his question, again, is how as an industry and one that focuses so much on experience, qualification, licensing, etc., yeah. will we recover from such a skills gap? I think big challenge. I think this is a big challenge. Now, um, on, one, on, one, on one, one hand, you look at the, you know, um, uh, let's say, to, uh, you know, licensed individuals like, um, like engineers and pilots. Um, there are a lot of redundancies now, very sadly, and people will be losing their jobs. But what that does for the market as a whole, um, you know, is put a lot of people on back on the job market, and therefore there may be more more kind of transfer of of um, or opportunities for people to 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 move into new firms, new new countries, whatever, whatever. So you know, I, I've always sort of looked at it cyclical. You know, you see, you see the likes of you know China starting to recover already. North America largely domestically has 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 been you know sort of continuing and. To, to a large extent, not business as usual, certainly, but, but a lot more capacity flying around there than certainly in Europe. So I think probably the, what I would see is the licensed individuals and, and the demands that, 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 you know, that, that, that businesses previously had for those individuals um, you know, meant that there was, a, that was always a kind of a, um, an opportunity pipeline. And of course, now with a lot on, on the market, they may be able to kind of move around more easily uh, uh, geographically. So um, that's one aspect. I guess the other aspect is saying, and something you've and I touched on before, Chris, is saying this is this is something that 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 probably you know with the right kind of approach or right the right kind of systems in place in a in a, in a firm to identify future talent, cadet programs, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. apprenticeships, um, and yeah. bringing on young you know young young smart bright kids into your organizations, training them, coaching them, mentoring them, you know, bringing them through the, um, through the, the process, you know, moving them from one, you know, from the commercial of the business to the operational side, to the handling side, to the services, yeah, and giving them as much exposure as possible. Yeah, I think we're going to prob probably see as some of that, you know, as very senior talent sort of exits the business potentially. And we always said before that a lot of the people that you, that you lose are the good eggs. You know, um, uh, because they've maybe timed out or they're, um, you know, just sort of um, hitting retirement, maybe deciding that actually wouldn't retire if this hadn't happened, but maybe that's an opportunity now. So you lose a lot of that experience. So providing we can kind of capitalize or, or hold on to some of, some of that um, to train, coach, and mentor the young generation, I don't think there's anything to be afraid of. I think the problem we've got is that not all businesses are set up to, to create those pipelines and, and that, talent, um, that talent development. Uh, totally. Uh, and I, I think succession and having the confidence of existing management to focus on people that are potentially going to last longer and are, 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 are so it's a word I, I'm able to use quite easily, a lot more clever than, than I would be. I always think it's good to identify people that are better than yourself, train them up, make them really enjoy what they're doing. And then for a company perspective, they're going to stay. And I think that flexibility and, and that understanding of how the whole business works, that in itself makes that company more robust, resilient, agile, and it will keep that company, you know, con continuity or sustainable proof. So I think, I think, I think that's, that's, that's where one of the good things has to come. So I also think that um, there's a chance for companies, um, you know, to keep, keep in touch with people so that if the situation now is, Yes, numbers are going to reduce and there isn't the demand, etc. But keep in touch with those good people. Let them maybe access an online training that's related to some sort of skills so that if things do pick up and they're doing something that they have to do because they've got to keep their families and, and, and all of their commitments in place, that they can return without feeling that they've you know, left it too long or there's no chance to come back. So I think that sort of balance is something that, that, um, that would be great to see. Now, another part of the question was, are, are we likely to see what is heavily regulated as an industry with safety at the forefront take a negative turn due to inexperience? So it's a little bit linked. And I think it's something that people do fear, that if people do start to go and there isn't enough auditors, there isn't enough people renewing licenses, there isn't so much preventive maintenance, etc., people would question this, this safety element. So I think, again, coming back to the whiz air, the more that companies can focus on those concerns and make them flip over into a confidence level, I think that's the way forward. 
Well, I think I think you know um, the uh, a, a company's kind of you know sort of lives or dies by by its approach to safety and and the impact on on having or maintaining or not impact of not maintaining good safety and good security standards in its operation and the impact of that on its brand. So you know you, you live and die by your actions in good times and bad. So it's very simple for me um, in, in this regard. The DNA, you know, of a of a good firm or the fabric, you know, of, of a of a of a good airline, a good aviation um, firm, um, if if they are well set up and uh, you know disciplined in that space today, then I don't think that that that, that DNA or that the fabric sort of that, that that's created that business would allow them to to destroy or damage. At a critical time, what has been what has been essentially the, the the backbone to their success. I guess the challenge you've got is where you've got liquidity or cash concerns, or 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 you know um, uh, you know firms that are squeezing squeezing the rag dry, you know to get every you know to get every last little drop out of it, and um, you know sort of survival mode. Um, that's that that is a challenge. However, I guess what we need now is, is better cooperation and collaboration between. Between airlines and their service providers, yeah, and yeah. and therefore, you know, um, you know, not not audits for for the sake of audits, but good good qualitative processes and and audits and standards and and and, and so that will create early flags or lead indicators to potential kind of um, you know future risk. And I think as long as those conversations are going on, then you know there is always an arbiter, right? There's always there's always sort yeah. of a, there's a you know as you go up the up up the chain. And therefore, it's important to me that that um, that, that, that that stand out. So I, you know, I, I would be, I would be, um, I would be more confident that we that as long as those processes and those those systems are in place, that um, the industry would not uh, would not sort of fall back on itself and and allow allow the good efforts and good progress over recent years in safety standards and adoption of best practice to to to, to be defeated. Yeah, no, I think that's that's well put, Steve. And now the last and final part of Craig's uh, question which you touched upon briefly there, is are GSPs, airports and airlines, so fixated on managing the now that they are negating to look ahead? Uh, I, I, could you give a one-word answer? Yes. I mean, I, I, look, I mean that, that's, that's, that, that's always a challenge. Um, but, you know... It, it's it's a good link to what we were working on, though, isn't it? Eh? With the old... Uh, the, um, the COVID, the, the new normal formula. You know, exactly. The Skylight formula. Look, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I people guess um looking at things ahead now as well. And if they don't have the capacity to do it whilst they're surviving, they need somebody looking looking at that those areas for them. Well, look, I think I think there's 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 there is there is a lot of opportunity now to do for firms to do the right thing. And you know, we've seen historically in the past, Chris, where the relationship has not been balanced, there's been no equilibrium. Uh, between between you know airlines, GSPs, you know, and and the community, and I think that's got to be it's got to be right size. It's got to it's got to be it's got to be um, you know re, re, rebalanced. So I think you know as we move into the new normal, I think the new normal is still developing. If every day the new normal is um, is evolving, um, it's very much an iterative uh, process. Um, you know, but um, but creating creating a, a platform. To, to deal with that and respond to it is going to be important. So I think you're absolutely right. Thanks for the thanks for coining the the um, the, uh, the, the the formula. So the, I guess that that's all about us saying, you know, here is a here is a, a not all the answers, but a, a a toolbox. Yeah, framework. Yeah, yeah, framework. And and that and that's important. So um so you know, uh, but I do think I think I think community approach is important. I mean, we mentioned that a few times in the last few weeks, but you know, the community approach is going to be very important in this. Yeah, no, hundred percent. So Craig, thanks very much for those questions. And again, anybody who'd like to send any other questions for next week or any other time, please send your mails to Chris at evaint.com, and um, we will include them as we can. Now we've got a few more. Uh, from people who didn't mention their their surnames nor their their companies, but happy to have the questions anyhow. So, Jerry sent forward one with when when will we see airlines and airports actually agreeing on what to do together? So we've covered <laughs> a little bit, but but I think it's a it's a valid point there, and and especially when so many airlines and airports, even the same airline, but going between the O and D airports little practices are different because they're landing at one airport and they took off from a different airport. 
yeah. if that makes sense. So people are people are saying all the time, and I, I, I get it so often, they keep saying that the, the one that they pick up on is the security. Why do you have to take your laptops out at one place and not another? Why do you have to take your shoes off on one and not another? Why do you have to take your watch and your chains off? So all these differences make people think, do they really know what they want? Well, I guess look, the first step, the first step, thanks for the question, Jerry, is um, as we've seen this week is, um, is, is, you know, EASA published a very, a very uh, good and um, comprehensive uh, response to COVID-19. And we all wait and see now how that, how that plays out in terms of adoption. The problem we've got, Chris, I guess, always is difference between policy and process. Yeah. Um, so, you know, policy can be consistent. So the policy for aviation security screening standards is one policy uh, derived from ECAC, European Civil Aviation Conference, um, uh, across, across member states. But the process differs by, by state or by airport because the technology availability differs. Why? Because I can't imagine that Bournemouth will be, will be spending you know, significant sums on screening, screening machines that could allow customers to keep laptops in bags because of multidimensional screening um, uh, standards or capability versus a large hub airport where that does make sense with the throughput they've got. So, you know, are you meeting the standard and are you delivering, are you compliant with the policy? Yes. But the process to achieve that may be different. We're going to have the same with the, with the health and hygiene response to COVID-19 for sure. Yep, which, which comes back again to communication and clarification. And if people had mm -hmm. better, better. So that, I, mm -hmm. I, I, agree, I agree with you 100%. And it's sometimes, I sometimes think that, you know, when you're waiting in these queues, that if you had the screens up like you have in the States where it's talking about all the sites you're going to see and everything. But if it just said, you know, ladies and gentlemen, the reason we're in this queue or the reason you're in the queue with your fellow passengers is because, oh. and then we need to do this we need because to do i think largely it does i mean those those exist in in, in a, certainly the, the, the you know, main hub airports um but i so wonder they, if they, they, they exist with as much as what you've got to do but not the why and they say take this out of your bag be prepared get your stuff ready and all this sort of stuff and hmm. make sure you got it in your little plastic bags and stuff i guess but people i i just think the more time you spend telling somebody why, what helps you, the better they're going to understand your your process and and your practices yeah. and ultimately your performance. Yeah. So I, you know, I just think hopefully that this is going to make people do things so differently and see how certain things work in different industries and different times and 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 you know make you understand and appreciate it more because there's yeah. a, there is still an awful lot of frustration you see in these lines. Also, dare I say, a certain difference now of training for the people who have to do that job. I think that's going to be necessary as well. Yeah. Okay, now, another question sent in similar, but from two different people and from their names, I would imagine from two very different regions. Got Hassan um, and, and Pedro. Hassan has said, do you both have a logical list of what should be done? So that's been nice if we did. And how many items could be included on a general list? So that's from Hassan and from Pedro. Do you have a list, Chris? Over to you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, I think, I, 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 I think in general early, terms, but, but I, no, but I do. I think in general terms, you start with the logical scientific guidelines that have been provided. And then where something is, 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 is required and you risk assess, you then have the mitigating qualification to still follow those guidelines, but in a slightly different way. But it's not generalized for everybody. And I think the most important thing is that there's a general consistent list and then there's deviations or there's exceptions from that list, but they're still controlled because of risk assessment and they're in place because of necessity, which is why you've got the doctors, the nurses, uh, you know, all the frontline workers needing all the PPE because they can't keep that two metre social distancing. So there, there, there's things that have to be done to keep the world, to keep the world going. So, yeah. you know, I, I think even, even Hassan and Pedro, I'm sure they've got their own list and they, they would know, you know, you've got a social distance, you know, it's always safer to be side by side than in front of someone. If you're wearing masks, you're doing it because, you're caring about others rather than you just trying to protect yourself. I think the, the look, I mean, I, 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 for, 
in terms of the immediate response to this and you know the, to restart travel and to restart you know kickstart our industry again i think the the list the list that the list that, that matters and the list that should be used has to be universal and consistent so my yep. list or your list or pedro's list or hassan's list actually doesn't really matter it might matter in their business for their own business um, you know recovery bcp whatever but actually more generally more broadly this has to be a universal coordinated approach and so I think the list that matters now is um, is the is the EASA, um, IATA, ACI kind of you know guidance yeah. documentation policies that are um, standards that we published, and that's important that people should consider those and actually put their hand up and say, look, actually this is going to be a problem in my airport for X reason, or it's going to be a problem in my kind of my staff or my rest areas for Y reason, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and actually think about that so that if you create your own list from from the base guidance materials, I think that's certainly a very good start. Yeah. Um, and then, and then you can see actually how compliant you will you will be. The same thing as we're seeing in other countries for you know to allow restaurants or bars or whatever to reopen in some countries. I've heard that that, that the local environmental health or the equivalent and 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 your relevant city or, or country, they are they are prescribing the requirements that you that you need to be in place before you can reopen. And actually, in Kuala Lumpur, my home city. Um, I've known that um, that some some um, some uh, you know uh, restaurants have failed those compliance checks from the local authority, the local environmental health, meaning that their competitor over the road has been able to open, but that fellow's not. So if you don't want to be the guy that's closed and you know beyond beyond the, the necessary period or the restricted period, then you bloody better get your get your finger out and make sure that you're compliant or as you can conform as far as practically possible. If you can't make sure you put your hand up early before losing the opportunity to reopen. Yeah, and, and customers would, as they walk past somewhere that they used to go and now they go somewhere else, they'd be asking. That's right, what, exactly. And, and so that same is a critical er, element of what the exactly. practice will be in the future. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, no, I totally agree with that. And I've seen some great examples um, on, on the television. There's some, there was a warehouse and they've remarked all the flooring, so it's one way walking around the warehouse. But what they also did is where they had to do some quality, quality verification or they had to do some validation of some points, they made a, a screen, a plastic screen, that went all round the person and there was a bar on it on wheels and you could actually walk up within the two metres and you could talk to a colleague but not, not have any, any problems there. Same thing with a hotel. Better yeah. put one way, one way when you come out of your hotel room to get to the lift, so that you don't you don't have to cross over people because there's not that many corridors in hotels that are over yeah. two meters. Yeah. So people are doing things in a different way. I, I had it this morning to get my to get my coffee from my local shop downstairs. Um, it's one one way in and one way out. So you know people are already using their own their own um, or taking their own uh, initiative to yeah. do the right thing, and that's important. Doing the right thing is important. Yeah, and that, and, and that that's what that's proving what we started off with, which is, you know, there will be a new normal, and as you said, it's going to be changing as we keep going, but things have changed and they will continue, and things are definitely going to be different as we move forward. Indeed. So, Stephen, we're coming to the end of four great stuff. Four studies, I, ho I hope I hope we've not Stephen. I hope we've not lost any listeners yet. No, no, no. I'm sure not. I'm sure not. And and we've managed. We, we're getting more questions, which is good, and um, you know, we're getting we're getting a lot of interest. And one thing that um, um, some people have actually said to me is they're enjoying somebody like yourself giving some domestic tips once a week. So last week, oh. how to protect your <laughs> carpets, your carpets and from, materials from lily dust. From lilies. <laughs> and I, I understand you've got another um, domestic um, little dish to well, serve today. I, I've, I've been I've been able um, during during this lockdown um, to to uh, one spend a lot of time on my own, um, and whilst I enjoy my own company for the most part, it does get a little bit monotonous um, on occasion. So I've been researching and trying and trying um, trying some domestic chores um, in the absence of my of my darling wife. And um, a little tip that I found the other day was. Um, for those that uh, that want to, you know, uh, clean up their washing machine, clean clean their pipes in their washing machine and and, and clean their drum. The best way to do it is not put it on a hot wash on its own or or um, you know throw a throw a bit of bleach or whatever inside. It's to use three or four dishwasher tablets straight in the drum. Put the put on a forty degree wash as you would do normally. 
with your dishwasher tablets inside and the drum comes up sparkling. And if you want to watch the process, as I have done, I've had a lot of time on my hands, you can see the dirty water just um, exit from the machine. It's a very um, satisfying, satisfying uh, process. So dishwasher tablets in the drum, uh, actually 60 degree wash, use 60 degree, 60 is better than 40. I'm seeing you in a new light now. And for, for those that are listening who don't realize that, you know, your, 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 your lovely wife and son are a long, long, long way away. And you're at home in Malaysia uh, and I'm here in London. Yes. Yeah. But one, one day, one day and, and, <laughs> and hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. I've, been saying, I've been saying that since the 16th of March, Chris. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. But hopefully if you're, if you're good ladies watching this show, you're going to be very busy when you get back because she's going to say, I now know what you can do with lilies. I know what you can do with the, with the whites. And uh, cooking as well. Yeah. She is, yeah. She, is, she is very keen to see me replicate some of these dishes that I've been tossing up um, uh, uh, for myself. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, lots to do when I get back. But, uh, be, yeah, that's, uh, I hope there's light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, and maybe, maybe depending on how long it takes, we might be able to put a little short book together. You know, Saturday with Stevens, domestic tips. So who knows? <laughs> Listen, thanks very much again. Thanks, Chris. Have a great weekend. Yeah, and thanks to all of the listeners. You, yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and you too. And like I said, things are getting better. Things are a lot more positive. People are coming together. And I think there's a, a, you know, a definite focus on being there's a light and not a blocker. But also, one thing we must never forget, and hopefully everybody's memories will be very long, all of the health workers, frontline workers, incredible what they're doing and um a lot of gratitude and, and respect yeah, yeah. all right lovely boy take care see you next week if thank possible. you cheers all the best bye-bye